Welcome back to the Heal the Herd podcast. In this week's episode, I'm going to answer the question, what are the seven signs of high self-esteem? So let's just jump right into it. Number one, we know what we value and believe. Now to do that, we need to know our morals and values, needs and wants, negotiables and non-negotiables. See, we need a North Star, something that gives us a direction, provides stability, provides balance and a framework so we can honor our self-worth. So we know what dictates our self-worth. And if we get off against what we value and believe, we can recognize it and get ourselves back. And when we have those things set in place, now we have a barometer for what we're doing. This also allows us to live in our inherent purpose and achieve our life goals and succeed in whatever it is we choose. It also allows us to say no to people, places, and things that will divert us away from our self-worth, away from our inherent purpose, away from everything we want in our life and keep us from going against those values and the beliefs that we have. Now, I've just done a whole video series on exactly how to do this because I say it all the time. None of us have really sat down and mapped out those three questions. So I have three videos to help you do that. The first one is called Codependence Recovery, Understanding Morals and Values, and it'll show you exactly how to learn to start doing that for yourself. The second video is called Codependence Recovery, the importance of needs and wants, or actually I think it's setting your needs and wants, how to set your needs and wants. And the final video is codependence recovery, the how to determine your negotiables and non-negotiables. So those three things, you need the, the in-depth understanding of how all of those work to be able to walk in the, you know, the first level of high self-esteem, which is knowing what we value and believe, all right? Sign number two that we have high self-esteem is we face our imperfections. We believe inherently, it's one of our morals and values, that talking about and facing our imperfections makes us better. It doesn't make us bad. It increases the ability to do this, increases our self-worth because we value honesty. I talk about it all the time, the scales of injustice. This is part of the worst day cycle that I talk about in my book is we are all in massive denial. We just don't know we are because we're operating out of uh, a subconscious programming of pain and childhood where we developed false coping skills and a false reality of what's really happening in our life. Not because we're bad, we had no other option. It was a sur survival mechanism. But when we're in high denial, there's no truth. We can't authentically see ourselves and that's why we love to face our imperfections because the more we can see of our perfect imperfections, do you see what happens? Truth, honesty. Well, when I'm honest with myself, I love myself, think about it. Why do you get upset with yourself? Why do you beat yourself up? Because you're going against your morals and values, your needs and wants, negotiables and non-negotiables. And so the only way to conquer all of that is we have to become an expert in facing our imperfections and embracing them. And we see those imperfections as opportunities for growth, not that we're bad or defective. Like we developed all of these imperfections as a result of trauma and less than nurturing and abusive parenting. And so we are born a person and we develop personalities. And so what most people in this industry or, or, or even religion advocate is get rid of these bad things. Well, no. We develop these so-called bad traits as survival mechanisms. They are part of us. The recovery process is making peace with these, accepting these. These are just the pieces of us that never got loved. And so banishing them, that's not the answer. And so when you scream at yourself for how bad you are, all you're doing is reliving the trauma against yourself. Now you are the one traumatizing yourself. Recovery is about integration bringing those broken parts, accepting them, loving them, healing them, bringing them back in us. That's what makes us whole. The avoidance and shutting all of this down, never talking about it, never dealing with it, that keeps us sick. That keeps us in low self-esteem. That keeps us broken. That's why step number two or sign number two of high self-esteem facing our imperfections is so important. And therefore, as part of that, we have a daily plan in place to learn and grow from our mistakes and learning and growing about our imperfections. 
We're also capable and excited to hear criticism or critique um, or any type of negative feedback without losing our core belief because we've looked at these dark parts. We know they're there. And so when you point them out, it doesn't diminish us because we're integrating these back into us. We just see them as perfect imperfections that need love, just like the so-called good parts of us. That's why when you point it out, we don't lose our self-worth. We're okay with, you know, I've, I've done that in videos where, you know, I bring up people's comments and I show how many times they're right when they criticize me. Like, it's true, I struggle with those things. And so that's the part I had to learn was these imperfections are actually part of my perfection. It's the acceptance of them that gives me my self-esteem and self-worth. It's the avoidance that strips us of that. And finally, we don't put others down or judge them to build ourselves up. You know, that was the other video I did, how to turn any insult into a blessing. Man, I love to be criticized. Again, it shows me my darkness, but also when, when people are perfectly imperfect, they're showing me their darkness, their imperfections. Well, that's a gift. That's intimacy. Even if they don't know that that's what they're doing, I know that. And so that's why there isn't a need to put people down. Now you've seen me, I've talked about it in this co in that codependent series. Yeah, I put people down. Well, that's just a sign of that part of me, that dark part of me that still doesn't feel loved. And so I'm judging and putting people down. Well, that's something I'm constantly working on, integrating back in going, Lo, you're not so small that you have to build yourself up by stepping on them. It's not true that you're small. You're just hurt. That piece of me is just hurt, all right? So number three, um, we take sole responsibility for our life outcomes. This is huge. So much in society today, we are blaming society. We are blaming other people. We are claiming the mantle of victim. And that's only people with low self-esteem that will do that. We determine our life outcomes. Yes, we all, the, the essence of life is roadblocks. We all face them regardless of religion, creed, race, sex. Every one of us has roadblocks inherent in our makeup. That's just the process of life. And so when we have high self-esteem, we're not looking to put the blame on our lack of progress on anything other than ourselves. We take sole responsibility for our life is. We recognize that our choices have created the outcome we are currently experiencing in our life. No one else did this to us. We did this all ourselves, wherever we are. We are a byproduct of our choices and we own them. If needed, we become experts. We gain and learn new knowledge, skills, and tools to recognize, wait a minute, my life is in disarray or not where I want it because I'm lacking knowledge, skills, and tools. And so I put a plan in place to inform myself, to become better at overcoming that roadblock that's in front of me, that's getting in the way of the outcomes I want, but I don't blame it on other people. I use this story to communicate that in my book. The, I tell the story of a, somebody who's shot by a, a sniper. <clears throat> and the story goes like this. So you're just walking down the street. Imagine this was you. You're just walking down the street, just minding your own business. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you get shot. Well, the person with low self-esteem would scream at the government. They'd scream at other people that it's not their fault. This shouldn't have happened to them. Now, I don't disagree. It shouldn't have happened to them. But what they failed to recognize is they made thousands of choices on their way to be on that street at that time. You can't, a person with high self-esteem will not divorce themselves from the thousands of choices and the hours they made all those choices to get themselves to here. They're responsible for being in that position. Now it doesn't condone or let the sniper off the hook. They are not responsible for that. But as they lay there on the concrete, they have a choice. They can sit there and cry victim and blame the government and society and other people and even the sniper himself. Or as people walk by, they can ask for help. Could you lift me up? I need to get to a hospital. That's their responsibility. If no one will help them, it's their responsibility to use whatever energy they have to crawl, to get to a hospital. And it doesn't end there. 
getting doctor's care. Then after that, this is gaining the knowledge, skills, and tools. They go to physical therapy. Let's say they, it was in their leg. And so they're learning to walk again, rebuild the muscle. These are the obstacles that have been placed in all of our life. All of us have had this experience. We turned the corner. We got in a relationship where we just got hammered. A boss, a friend, a family member. This happens all day, every day. We are all experiencing moments like this, but we are all responsible for putting ourselves in that position. And then we are responsible to get ourselves out of it. Nobody else is. Only a person with low self-esteem. Do you see how disempowering that is? When I lay there on the concrete and I go, you have to fix this for me. You're to blame. I, have, I didn't do anything here. I will literally die on that sidewalk. Because now my whole outcome, my existence, is predicated on the government or somebody else rescuing me. Only a person with low self-esteem would take that position. A person with high self-esteem recognizes when I choose and take ownership of all of my life outcomes, I am choosing to be the author of my life. I love myself enough not to give my power away to everyone else. I will take this on myself. And this is just a roadblock. That's all it is. And it's a roadblock that's meant to be overcome. And I'm going to overcome it. Sign number four, we embrace change. We recognize that change is an opportunity. It's just there to make us better. It, it allows us a chance to experience more joy and more opportunities throughout life. See, when we close ourselves off, do you see we're missing out on life? Remember, what's our greatest experience in life? Hitting a roadblock and getting over it. Well, what's change? It's a roadblock. It's something put in front of us. But once we conquer it, we feel it's the greatest feeling we have is learning how to overcome this challenge in our life. So we don't fear change when we have high self-esteem. Now, change, pardon me, change is something I really struggle with. It literally scares me because of what I went through in my childhood. See, my life would be going perfect and out of no more, nowhere, I'd come home from school or wake up in the morning. Or here's the perfect example. I had come home. I was playing hockey after high school. I'd come home for Christmas. I was desperate to come home. So exciting. Christmas at our house was magic. Absolute magic. Well, I'd spent the day practicing. You know, it's up in Canada playing hockey. Come home. I'm practicing. And my dad picks me up and I'm in the best mood. I've been hanging out with my high school friends. You know, it's my first year away. I'm back home. It's Christmas, the best time of year to connect with my dad and everything. And as, as I get in the car, my dad goes, hey, Kenny, um, I need to let you know that your mom disappeared today. We don't know where she went. <laughs> Change. Just out of nowhere. I'm in a great place. Wham life's roadblocks. Well, then we pull into the garage and I open up the door and there's my sister on the phone screaming at the police. Please, please. I know it hasn't been 48 hours, but you please have to find my mother. She's in a hotel threatening suicide. Boom. Change scares the living hell out of me. It does. I have every reason to be scared of change, but I also know my greatest gifts, my greatest lessons in life, my greatest blessings in life have come from confronting moments like that that were prevalent all throughout my childhood where I'd walk in and my mother would be in a situation like that. I get an opportunity to overcome that pain. I get an opportunity to reclaim myself that in that moment my mother was doing that to her but because we're not developed we think it's being done to us. Every time change comes up, I get an opportunity to put further distance from that trauma and that pain that almost killed me and took my life. That's why we embrace change when we have healthy self-esteem. It brings us opportunity. It brings us joy. When we avoid it, we stay stuck in those traumatic moments. They own us. They rob us of our life and our existence. We don't allow that to happen anymore. That's a sign of high self-esteem because we look forward to the opportunities that they provide us. If our life is not where we want it, we put a plan in place. Do you see a common theme? 
the self-ownership in all of this, when you have high self-esteem, it's all about, hey, things aren't working. It's my responsibility. I'm gonna put a plan in place to make changes. I'm gonna gain the knowledge, skills, and tools to become an expert in whatever this mountain is, whatever this struggle is that I'm having. I invite a healthy level of risk into that because there's always a level of risk in taking on these things. What's gonna happen? I don't know, the fear of the unknown. Well, that's a healthy level of risk. When we have high self-esteem, we recognize we can't achieve the peace, the relationships, the success, the financial comfort, whatever it is that we want. We cannot achieve it without experiencing a healthy level of risk and embracing change. Number five, we have a healthy relationship outlook. This is critical. Again, look at the ownership. We own that every single person that ever comes into our life, whether it be a friend, a marriage, someone we date, live with, doesn't matter. The only reason they're in our life is because we allowed them into our life. We take full ownership of that. And therefore, we recognize that any aspect of the relationship, whether it was good or bad, we are responsible for. We're not responsible for them choosing to be bad actors or be mean or unkind, but we are responsible that we allowed this into our life. And therefore, we look at ourselves and go, wow, what was it in me that was attracted to this? And if I wasn't aware that this person could be this way, that is also about me. I need to gain more knowledge, skills, and tools about human dynamics, about relationship dynamics. Because trust me, when you learn the things I talk about in my book and all my videos, like every single client of mine, once they get through this process, they can walk in a room and they can tell you immediately just simple little things a sentence out of somebody's mouth and they can tell you what type of person they are and whether they'll be kind or abusive. It's that easy. It literally is. It's that easy. It's not complicated. Everyone, the only reason people end up in bad relationships is because they don't have the knowledge, skills, and tools about how to look for these things and what certain characteristics there are. That's it. Well, that's my responsibility to fix. And when I have a healthy relationship outlook, I take ownership of that. I don't sit as a victim and just like a tree in the wind going, I wonder who's gonna pass me by and land on my leaves. And all of a sudden it's a bug that's eating every leaf on the tree. We're not passive in that. We take ownership. We don't condone others' mistreatment, but we see that mistreatment as, oh my gosh, I need to go learn something. This is about me. When we have high self-esteem, we always take ownership of our relationships. Number six, we put a plan in place to take care of ourselves physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, every area of our lives. We see that as our responsibility, not anyone else's. We also ask for and accept help from others. We are not walled off and shut down. We see that connection is a part of high self-esteem and the avoidance of it is low self-esteem. We also celebrate when those close to us are unavailable to support us because we recognize that ultimately we're capable of doing it for ourselves. I call this, you know, we most of us have been raised in that codependent Kardashian reality TV model of, and you'll see memes all across the internet of, unconditional love, you've got my back, I'm waiting for the man or woman who always supports me and always loves me and sees me every day as perfect. That's garbage, that's abusive, that's fantasy. That is somebody with low self-esteem looking to be rescued. That is not kind, that is not love, that's not an authentic vision of what love is. It's not at all. True love recognizes that there are times in our life when our partner can't be there. Reminds me of a great story. There's an old fable of a girl who was getting married very young and her grand she went to her grandmother who had been married like 60 years and she was like, grandmother, what's the secret? How did you guys last so long? And she said, well, you know, sweetie, when I was your age, we went to our pastor and we asked him for some guidance. And he said, my suggestion to you is that you both write down three things that no matter what, you will always forgive in each other. And so, 
the granddaughter turned to her and said, well, what were the things you wrote down? And she said, you know, sweetie, whenever your grandfather did something that I didn't like, or that frustrated me, I just kind of rolled my eyes and said, huh, must be one of the three things. Now, the truth is that's fantasy. You don't want to just, you, you, you don't want to excuse poor behavior, but the sentiment is accurate. Because in a true healthy relationship and somebody with high self-esteem, they recognize that all those memes on Facebook and everything are false. They are a fantasy, they're not reality, that they're, that is perfectly normal, that our partner will not support us and that they shouldn't, especially when our behavior is poor, they shouldn't have our back at all times. And because we have high self-esteem and because we hold ourselves accountable and because we we are willing to face our imperfections, when they're unwilling to support us, we put a plan in place to support ourselves. And we appreciate that they hold us accountable and don't support our poor behavior, that they love us enough to do that. We also recognize that society has taught us all to be codependent. So we put a plan in place to gain the knowledge, skills, and tools to learn about that, overcome it, and learn interdependence. You see, we don't play the victim. And going back to the relationship aspect, we don't blame these aspects on our partner. We take ownership of them because do you see what this means? If I'm sitting here and I'm blaming the government, I'm blaming society, I'm blaming the other sex, I'm blaming certain religions or races for all the problems in my life and in the world and in my relationships. And I'm expecting them to alter their behavior to make things better for me. Do you see what that ultimately says about me? I don't believe in myself. I need you to be different for me to be okay. That is classic, massive, low self-esteem. It's not a righteous position of I want something better because I'm asking you to be different. I'm not accepting that you see the world differently. You're allowed to see the world differently. You're allowed to be the victim if that works for you. It Look, it works for many people. It's a great position to sit back and go, ah, oh, it's none of it's my fault. It's all these other people. Now government and somebody fix it for me. Help me out. I get to stay the child. I don't have to be responsible for anything. I get to lay on the concrete and have everybody come fix it for me. It's a wonderful position. It works, but it's a sign of massively low self-esteem and it's a sign of a professional victim who does not want to take ownership of their life and wants to spend their life in purgatory, always waiting to see if somebody's going to rescue them. The other thing is like I, when I talk with parents of how, you know, how this support works is, I get lots of messages of people going, well, my granddaughter's with a narcissist or they're with this terrible marriage and you know, my daughter and son, oh my God, how do I help them? And what they don't recognize is their desire to fix the situation. Their, their child doesn't want to deal with it. They're playing the victim. They're laying on the concrete looking for somebody else to solve the problem. And so when mom and dad come in and try and fix it, they don't realize that they're sending the message to their child, I don't believe in you. I don't believe you have the skills and tools to do this. I'm gonna fix it for you. If we really love our child, is that the message we wanna send them? I mean, I do it at times, I, I you know, but I recognize, oh my God, I just taught my kids I don't believe in them. Shoot, I need to go make amends and turn that around. If we truly love our children, if we truly want them to gain self-esteem, we give them an avenue to learn the skills, tools, and knowledge, but we don't fix the problem for them. Number seven, the seventh and final sign of high self-esteem, we communicate effectively. We seek to be intimate. We seek to be vulnerable. We want to share our thoughts and feelings without fearing rejection. We are open about our darkness and our imperfections. We're open about our pain. We create and want an intimate connection. We recognize that rejection isn't even possible. It's a construct that's been made up. Nobody ever, ever rejects us, ever. It's a sign of our lack of self-esteem when we feel rejected because I am now placing my worth and my value and whether I can accomplish anything in your hands. I only have value if you keep me around. That's low self-esteem. 
Now we all feel that, I feel it myself, but that's a result of poor parenting. It's not authentically true. Think about it. Why did your spouse leave you? Because their morals and values, needs and wants and negotiables became different. That had nothing to do with you. Now they may have said, you didn't do this, this or this. Well, that just means they, whatever those things were, they wanted more of that. Well, that's about them. Remember, we can't support and do everything for everybody. We do what's best for us and our morals and values. You can only do this much of it. They need this much. That's about them. You're perfectly fine at this amount. And see, we communicate that. We don't feel rejection when somebody leaves us. We embrace that they're meeting what works best for them. <clears throat> we totally own our life when we have high self-esteem. If you look through the theme of this, all of this is based on, I am the author of my creation or my destruction. It's my choice. And if I don't know how to do it, I put a plan in place to gain the skills, well, the knowledge, skills, and tools to overcome the obstacle. I stop looking for things outside of me to fix the problem. It's not their problem. There were thousands of choices I made before I got in front of this person, before I got in that car accident, before whatever it is that happened, I'm responsible for that. I believe in myself. I'm gonna do the work to figure out what put me in that position. And once I learn that, I will create a new outcome. I believe in myself that much. Those are the seven signs of high self-esteem and those are the underlying key factors to walk in it, all right? So if you like this content, if you think it'll help somebody, please share it. Leave me your comments. And if you'd like to see more of this, please subscribe. And as always, enjoy the journey.